kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always a great honor and a great pleasure to be here, to be invited by the Prado and the friends of the Prado. I was just told that, that there are currently 32,000 friends. I'm really amazed by this great number of friends this beautiful museum has. And it's always a pleasure and an honor to be here. In fact, it brings back fond memories. A long time ago, on my honeymoon, the first visit was to Madrid, and the first museum I ever visited as newly wedded couple was the Prado. But ladies and gentlemen, before turning my attention to Peter Bruegel and saying a little and referring back to the lecture I gave, some of you may have heard it in July, and looking a little at uh, Joran Boss, I do want to go back two weeks. It was two weeks ago, I was in a meeting with several colleagues, museum directors from larger museums in Europe, and then we heard the surprising news for all of us that Miguel Sigasa was going to leave the Prado just after this great infrastructural plan with Norman Foster. And I do think I will speak on behalf of many of my colleagues, museum directors, museum curators, that we feel that this is a great loss for the Prado, Bilbao, Bilbao will be very happy to have its son back, his family to have the husband back. And I do want to congratulate Sukasa and his staff and all his collaborators on what he has done in the last 15 years. Always the Prado was a great collection, but what the Prado has done in the last 15 years in terms of infrastructure, of research, exhibition, outreach program, makes it into one of the leading museums in Europe. And I really want to congratulate and thank uh, Miguel for all that he has done in this beautiful museum. But ladies and gentlemen, I was asked to give a lecture on two of the highlights uh, in the Prado. One which was acquired very recently, and the other which entered the Prado early in the 19th century. Of course, these are the feast of St. Martin's Day, the wine of St. Martin's Day, and the triumph of death. I will go more into depth in the, to the two paintings, explain to you uh, their history, their meaning, their interpretation, and then I want to connect them to the taste and the, 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 the collection of Jeroen Bosch. But let us first, oh, this is the wrong. <coughs> Here we have Peter Bruegel. Um, just very briefly, who is Peter Bruegel? Actually, we do not know very much about his life. We do not know where he was born. There are two or three smaller cities in the southern Netherlands, uh, which are possibilities. It could even be, be Antwerp. He was born somewhere between 1525 and 1530. We do know that he was trained in Antwerp in uh, the workshop of Pieter Koeker van Aalst. It was in the middle of the 16th century, and Pieter Koeker van Aalst was the leading painter and the leading artist uh, in the southern Netherlands at this time. He then left as a young, talented draftsman. Um, he, uh, he left for Italy. He stayed in Italy for two to three years, and he came back not as a painter, but as a draftsman, and he designed uh, drawings for prints, landscape, allegorical drawings. And then from 1558 onwards, he started concentrating on a career as a painter. Uh, first in Antwerp, he lived in Antwerp until uh, 1562. He was then betrothed and married and moved to Brussels in 1562. Uh, there, he probably went to Brussels to be nearer to the court the, the, Brussels was the court city, Antwerp was the economic center of the, the Low Countries, Brussels was the political center of the Low Countries, and he probably moved there to be nearer to the court. Uh, he died very young, uh, 1569, 
Um, the last dated paintings, the last painted, dated works are from 1568. Um, we have a very small corpus of uh, paintings by Peter Bruegel in my catalogue. I have 44. There are some paintings which are debated, so let's say 45 paintings and 65 drawings, and that is what is left of the oeuvre of one of the great giants in the history of art. This is a contemporary portrait. This was uh, published in 1571, two years after his death, but was probably based on a portrait that was made during his life. It was uh, printed and published by his friend, Jeronimus Koch. Jeronimus Koch was the most important uh, print publisher of his time who, and who published pr printed books, who published prints, uh, who were spread throughout Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, the first painting which I would like to discuss is this painting. It's the Wine of St. Martin's Feast. It was probably painted, but I will go more in detail around 1566, 1567. It was acquired by the Prado in 2010, uh, was restored and first shown to the public in, uh, the, from the December 2011 onwards. But my story with this painting began slightly earlier. It was in the summer of 2008 that I was received a phone call from one of the uh, great auction houses in London. There are only two, so you can make a guess, one of the two. Uh, I was telephoned and they said, Mr. Selink, we have a painting that could possibly be close to Bruegel. It is somewhere uh, in, in Spain, and we would like you to have a look at it, and we would like you to have a look at it uh, quite soon. So after this phone call, I, uh, a week later, I flew to Madrid, then to a city which I will not name, uh, and was ushered into a large villa, into a where it was a corridor, the corridor, this is a painting, you know it, you've seen it as a large painting, the corridor was nearly, it's only slightly bigger than the painting, and there in the corridor was very dark, was nearly no light, I saw this painting. Unknown in the literature, there was a reference uh, by a Spanish art historian who published it, uh, but to the Bruegel scholars it was completely unknown. Unknown, but not unknown, because we knew that Bruegel had painted something like this. For instance, we have this painting. As you can see, if we go back, this is a fragmentary copy. This is in, in Vienna in the Kunsthistorisches Museum. This was probably painted around 1580, 1590. Uh, this was originally part of a complete copy of the Prado painting, which probably due to damage, possibly fire, possibly moist, uh, was cut down uh, somewhere in the 17th century. We also, in Brussels, we have a painting by Peter Bruegel the Younger. Peter Bruegel the Younger never knew his father. Peter Bruegel the Younger was only two years old when his father died. But after 1600, Bruegel the Younger uh, made had a large workshop which produced countless copies of originals by his father. And one of them is this. This is a life-size, one-to-one copy after the Wine of St. Martin's Feast, which is in the Royal Museum in Brussels. So we knew that there must have been an original Peter Bruegel. We had a co the copy, the partial copy in Vienna. We had several drawings and an engraving from the later uh, 17th century. We also had archival records. We know that in the Gonzaga collection, the famous collections of the, the, the Dukes of Mantua, uh, in the infantry in 1626-27, there was a description of un quadro di pentivo la festa di San Martino con un quantità di pitocchi che bevano ad una botta. So that's a 
and painting, with the feast of St. Martin, uh, with many people who are drinking from a, a, a large barrel. And it was, so this is this inventory from the early 17th century, an opera del Boal. Boal Vecchio was this a work by Peter Bruegel, uh, the elder. So we knew a composition like this existed. We knew that possibly an original was mentioned and was in the Konzaka collection in 1626. We know that copies had been made in the late 16th century. We also know that these copies were made, we know this from an engraving by Abraham Bruegel, who was the great grandson of Peter Bruegel, that they were made in Rome. So we know that there must have been an original St. Martin's Feast and that it must have been uh, in Italy in the uh, 17th century. But then when you receive, and go back, when you receive an image like this, of course you don't immediately think, yes, this is the original. It was then even more black, and I thought, well, interesting, this could perhaps be another copy after the lost composition, but it looks good, so I really would like to see it. So there I was, somewhere in the south of Spain, and I said uh, to, uh, to, to the owners, I said, well, I can't see it here in the corridor. There's not enough light. He said, no problem. Uh, two of his servants took out the painting from the corridor, put it outside against a palm, and there I was with the burning Spanish sun around 11 o'clock, and there this painting was standing outside was 42 degrees, but I didn't feel the heat. <laughs> I saw this painting, and then you feel, wow, this is spectacular. This is brown, this is dirty. It's because of its technique, it's a touche line, it's tempera paint on a canvas. This is a very fragile technique, uh, which, uh, which easily damages throughout the ages. But you immediately felt, yes, this is of a high quality. So I took some photographs, I made a report. Um, I had to promise not to say anything to anybody, and they asked my advice, and I said, I think this could be, could be close to Peter Bruegel the Elder, but I said, this needs technical examinations, and I said, the only place in Spain where this can be done on a high level is the Prado, the conservation studio of the Prado. Um, so I would advise the owners, I was talking to the auction houses, not to the owners directly. I said, you should contact the Prado and see if it can be researched. I had promised not to say anything. The only person I spoke to was my wife. And I had to wait long. <laughs> so this was the summer of 2018, uh, 2008. And then it was November 2019. <laughs> was November 2019, and then somebody who I knew quite well, Gabriele Finaldi, director of uh, the collections here of research, and he said, Manfred, we have a painting in the studio which I hear you have seen before. I said, I know what you're talking about. And he said, I want you to come to Spain immediately. So there I was, it was on a Thursday, I blocked my entire agenda, and then I flew, uh, the next week I flew to Madrid, where I met, I'm very happy she's here, I met Pilar, I met Gabriele, uh, met, met the people from the conservation studio, and there was this painting which I had seen in the burning sun somewhere in the south of Spain. And we all had the same gut feeling, yes, this is really sensational, uh, and yes, uh, the Prado, its conservation studio, Pilar, other experts all came, looked at the painting, and then Gabriela and Miguel asked me, and they asked me, you must be very honest, do you think this is Peter Bruegel the Elder? Because they, the Prado could take an option to buy the painting. And I said, I am 99% sure, but 100%, no, I cannot say. This needs treatment, but if I were director of the Prado, I would go on and, and, and look what can be done. And there we went, and every two months, uh, Pilar knows this, uh, I flew into the Prado, we discussed the painting, it was Elisa Mora who did the, the, the conservation treatment, and more and more it became, 
clear, yes, that the painting was damaged to the extreme. Yes, it was, uh, yes, it was very dirty. But as Elisa Mora cleaned the painting and the original paint came clear, yes, this is really superb. Yes, this is Prado. And then something happened which I never shall forget. So this was 2009. From 2009, it was in a conservation studio. Conservation went on and on. And that was September, the second half of September 2010. Then Gabriele Finaldi found me again. He was still breathing. I could still, he was excited. He had run. He said, Manfred, Manfred, Elisa and Pilar have just discovered the signature. There, so here we have all the copies we knew, so we knew it existed. We have copies by other artists. So this was the painting, and there, in the lower left corner, barely visible, so here's a number. Here, you see Bruegel, and you see a partial date, 1560, but then it becomes a little unclear. We could also, and, and the conservation specialist, and, 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 and we looked at this very closely, uh, it is undeniable that the, the, the signature is an original signature, it's on the layer, uh, on, the, or, or, uh, on the, ground, uh, of the, the ground of the painting, so this is undeniably um, the, the original signature by Bruegel, and then, of course, what happened within a week after that the signature was discovered, a truly, and rightly so, proud Minister of Culture of Spain, together with the directors of the Prado, announced that the Prado had acquired the painting. And then, and then you know the story from uh, November 2011, and Pilar and I published an article and a book on, on, on the subject. Uh, it was on view here in the Prado and become one of the new stars of the Prado Museum. Now, it was interesting, and I will come to back this, to this uh, later, that nobody knew in the collection where it was, and I will dwell slightly on this subject somewhat later, that it was a painting. So in the original collection, where it was first documented. So, as I told you, it was in the Konzaka collection, 1626, 1627. Uh, Pilar did a very thorough research on the provenance, and she rightly assumes that it probably left Mantua before 1630, because there was a looting of the castle, and as the, the painting still existed, we expect that it went, probably went uh, to Rome. Um, where it went, it was in the possession, probably was in the possession of a collector, where we know it was in 1662, a certain Giacomo Morselli. We know that it must have been in Rome after 1670. It was then that Abraham Bruegel, the great-grandson uh, of Peter Bruegel, must have seen the picture because he made an engraving after it. And then somewhere, uh, let's say between 1670 and uh, 1690, it must have been uh, acquired by the ninth Duke of Medini Kali, I'm sorry if I do not pronounce it uh, uh, correctly, um, who was the, at that point the ambassador uh, of the Spanish kings uh, in Rome and later was the vice um in Naples. So this painting was, in the last decades of the 17th century, was acquired by one of the great Spanish collectors, uh, was first probably in Rome with this collector of Medicali family, and then uh, with this family property, went to Spain, where it was until 1956. So it was a painting, and that is important, uh, that entered as a Bruegel in its first uh, inventory. It was mentioned as a work by Peter Bruegel. It was also valued very high, just as high as the best works of Velázquez. So it was seen as an important work. It was probably still in a good collection when it was, in, uh, when it was there in the late 17th and early 18th century. But then, probably due to the fact that the Tuchlein technique 
uh, became worse and worse, the, the painting became worse and worse, it became browner and browner. Somewhere in the late 18th century, early 19th century, they did no longer in this family collection, no longer knew that it was a work by Peter Bruegel. And you can see this because at the back, and that was what I already saw in 2008, what was written El Bosco, question mark. So they thought perhaps, you know, we'll return to El Bosco uh, in the late 18th century, they assumed that this painting was a work by Euronymous Boss. And then it faded out of memory, it became deteriorated, it became darker and ended in a corridor and now is restored again and uh, rightly so documented and certainly one of the great works by, uh, by Peter Brodel. So this is the, the history of the painting, but what is depicted? Here you see it, it's the wine of St. Martin's Feast. St. Martin is a completely, St. Martin of Tours, a city in uh, France, is a completely mythological figure. There are no archival documents that he ever existed. Um, he became a soldier uh, in the second, third, uh, according to the legends, uh, the Legenda Aurea, which were very popular in the later Middle Age Ages. Uh, he was a soldier and an officer uh, in, in, in the Roman army, and during one of the travels with this army, it was cold and he saw beggars, and the beggars were cold, and although he was from a noble family, he himself was not very rich, so he had no money in him to give to the beggars. And then according to the Legenda Aurea, he uh, cut his cloak into half and gave the cloth to the beggars so that they would have something warm to wear in the middle of the winter. Now there were other legends uh, with St. Martin, but those are less important. This is what you most often see depicted. And in the course, of the, uh, the Middle Ages, and certainly in the later Middle Ages, St. Martin became a very popular saint, especially uh, in the northwest uh, of, of Europe. And the feast of St. Martin is November 11. And more and more in the later Middle Ages, something interesting happened. The feast of St. Martin became really a feast, a banquet feast. It was a day in which the church or landowners would give food, wine, beer to the poor. And it would be a day of feasting, banqueting for all the poor, all the people. It was the end of the wine harvest uh, in November. So there would be a feast. And then the next day, a period of 40 days of fastening would follow. So this was the first period of fasting. You would then, until Christmas, you would behave strictly, and then on the eve of 11th of 11th, you could drink as much and do whatever you want. And this is what you often see depicted. You see the feast of St. Martin and the pouring of wine. Now you would think wine, Flanders, Belgium, so north, yes. Uh, until the third quarter of the 16th century, wine, uh, grapes grew uh, in Belgium, was a large wine production, but around 1560, 1570, there was a, what we call a small ice age, the average temperature dropped uh, two to four degrees, uh, with a lot of consequences, I'll return to that, but also, of course, the growing of grapes became uh, became more and more impossible, and this uh, the, 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 the northern part where the grapes would grow would be the north of France and no longer be Belgium. So in the time of Bruegel, uh, growing of wine, of growing of grapes and making wine was still part of the culture. So this is what you see. Of course, not a, it's not a photograph, it's not a snapshot, it's an, an image of a village or something between a village's and the, the city, you can see a city tower in the background. You, um, so it, it's, it's not entirely uh, uh, a, a, a village, it's not entirely a city, but a combination of the two. And you see how there is a large barrel. I will show you more details. 
where wine is coming out, and then you see people trying uh, to go to the details. Yes, this is one of the composition which inspired Peter Bruegel. Here you can see the capacity of Peter Bruegel to make very complex uh, compositions. This is the, the, the Sermon of St. John uh, in, in Budapest, um, which has the same kind of circular structure here around St. John, not around the barrel. But here you see some of the details, and you, you must realize, if you look at this painting, that there are, uh, um, we, we counted them, I, I forgot, I think there are 92 uh, large figures which, uh, which are to be seen on, on this, this painting. Very complicated, very ambitious. It's the largest painting, the largest composition we have of Peter Bruegel. It's the most complex uh, composition which we have. So you see all the paupers, you see all the, the peasants, all the people living in the villages, you see them around the vessel and you see them trying to fill uh, mugs, uh, bowls, even uh, the filling hat with wine which is pouring from the vessel. We also try to find whether it's white wine or red wine. Uh, I'm not a specialist in, in the historical process of, of wine, wine making, but people told me in that in the 16th, early 17th century, there was no distinction between white and red wine. It was a, uh, a, a, something in between. So here you see the vessel, here you see people really uh, climbing everywhere. Here you can see the sheer quality, even if the paint is damaged. If you look at the, the brushwork, the way it's, it's painted, how rapidly it's done. Um, it's a very loose technique. This is uh, very typical for the Tuchlein technique. So normally uh, Bruegel would paint in the oil technique. This is more laborious. Then you can work into detail. You can paint layer over layer. Uh, but with the Tuchlein te technique, with a tempera kind of uh, colors, which dry much quicker, you have a very rapid brush stroke. It must have been very bright. So this tooth line must have been extremely bright when it was was produced. And you see some remnant of the original colors, specifically here around the red barrel. So you see the people c coming out. Now, this is very interesting uh, if you look at the work um, of Peter Bruegel, because in the first place you would think this is an act of charity. You give the poor, the peasants, you give them, would also receive on St. Martin's Day, also would receive meat, you give them wine, you give them food, you give them drink. But actually, is it an act of charity? Because if you look at the results of what the people are doing, and we'll look at it more closely, we'll look at more into detail. They're fighting with each other. They're not being very kind and generous to each other. It reminds more, so this is a print after a composition by Peter Bruegel. This is called the Gula. It's one of the, the capital sins. And there you can see actually the people doing the same. You can also see a barrel here, of somebody being drunk. So what you see here is more like displaying a vice, one of the sins, one of the capital sins, than showing an act of charity. And that's very typical for Peter Bruegel, this irony, this mingled layer, something which at first glance, if you look at the subject, seems to be one, an act of charity. But if you look at it, if you continue, you look at the people, Whereas here, they're still very enthusiastic. Um, here, it's really slowly getting out of control. And you can see them trying to drink as quickly as possible. You can see them f getting fighting here. So these are the results. So that's a very ironic turn of fate. That was, is an act of charity. We will have a, if you go back again, everything begins with St. Martin here. This is the good part. St. Martin dividing the cloak. It's very typical, it's difficult to see, but here you can see the church, here you can see the village. 
So he's underneath the church. So in, essentially the right side here is the good side, the charitable. But the more you get to the left, here they are fighting. Here somebody is already down. So it becomes worse and worse. So actually, this is sins and vices, becoming virtues, becoming sins and vices. And then, you can see them down and out here. For instance, this. Also very typical for the wit and irony of Peter Bruegel. At first think, this is harmonious. This is a woman giving something to her child. But what is she giving? Wine. Making her into one of the future drunks, which are all around here. <laughs> and what you can also see, the children are everywhere. Giving this the bad example. And what you see here, it is very nice as well, is that people are being robbed as well. If you we go back here, it's in the front. I forgot to, to take the detail. You can see it. Uh, here is a woman standing. I have to, I'm not, I'm not in the right position of it. Sorry, forgot to take the detail. Uh, here. Look into that detail. There you can see a woman which is so absorbed into watching the people trying to fight for the wine that she does not see that she, her purse is being taken away. And then, if you look, it's a small young monk or a monk-to-be. You can see the tonsure, which is bald head here. So what, again, at first sight seems to be very clear Something positive is, in fact, the world of virtues, but more the world of vices. And then you must relate this picture to what is happening in the Low Countries in this period. The cities, like Antwerp, were exploding. So Antwerp, in 40, 50 year times, grew between 1500 and 1570, grew from a relatively small provincial city, 20, 25,000, to a city of more than 120,000 inhabitants. It was an explosion. It became the most uh, important economic city in the northwest of Europe. But with all of its side effects, enormous influx of immigrants, people searching work, searching living, in a period with a lot of famine, with uh, the beginnings, as I said, of the Ice Age, there was hunger, specifically in the countryside. Um, so there were, was a lot of poverty. There were a lot of peasants in the city without work. And there were all kinds of discussions at that point who to, should take care of the social welfare? How were cities to cope with this influx something which is very contemporary, something which you are wrestling today with as well, how cities and, and authorities uh, would cope with the influx of immigrants, how they would organize social welfare, the question if social welfare uh, was a duty for the government or not, or was a duty for the religious authority or the civil authorities. And uh, it is, is exactly in this period that orphanages uh, uh, and, and structures for the poor uh, and the orphans were organized. And you see the, uh, a very interesting side effect. This man is down, and you see a black hand on the back of his shirt. And that's the sign, that's the sign, and, and those of you who've been in Antwerp may recognize the fact that the hand you will see everywhere because it's, it's part of the, the, the weapon. It's a symbol for Antwerp. Um, uh, you will find it, for instance, in the back of panels. Uh, panel makers used to uh, use the hand as the sign that it was produced, a panel for a painting was produced in Antwerp. And here, in this period, um, 
the, the city authorities started giving cloth and clothes to the poor and to the needy. But then they suddenly realized that most of the poor and needy, and we have documents about this, immediately sold the clothes again to use it to buy alcohol and to buy wine. And to prevent them from selling these goods, all the cloths which they gave to the poor and needy in Antwerp had a black hand on the back so they could no longer sell it. So here you see that in a very implicit and a very interesting way, Peter Bruegel introduced aspects of the society around him with discussions. He was not a moralist. This is not social criticism. These paintings were bought uh, by the most wealthy of collectors. They were bought by people like Cardinal Granville. They were bought by uh, the mint master of Antwerp. They were bought by the richest of merchants. So you cannot see these as a kind of some of my colleagues do as a social proto-capitalist criticism. But he does include debates which were very much alive in Antwerp, in the southern Netherlands. He does include this in a very sub subtle and intriguing way um, in paintings such as these, pointing towards the tensions which there were, the tensions between the exploding cities and the impoverished countryside, tensions uh, between social classes, the very rapid rise of a, an urban high class with m merchants, uh, and, and the higher educated and a substantial growth of the poor and the, the needy and the uneducated tensions which were everywhere and which were strengthened by the fact that there were also religious strifes. Uh, you may know that the, uh, the, the, the church, the Roman Catholic Church was in crisis, so the, the battles between the Calvinists uh, and the various types of Calvinists and the Roman Catholic Church uh, was omnipresent uh, in, 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 in Antwerp at that period. Uh, it was the lower countries were on the brink of a civil war, an uprising against uh, the Habsburg rulers. So it were uncertain times. On the one hand, a booming economy with new rich, uh, a new upper class, uh, on the other hand, exploding a number of people who were needy. And this is certainly an aspect that is present uh, in the paintings by Peter Bruegel and would have been very much recognizable by the clientele who bought paintings such as these. And please remember the clientele of Peter Bruegel belonged to the highest of circles. So here you see the mother again. Ah, and here you see the various details. Ah, here is the detail with the hand. The man is down and out. So this is again to show you the picture uh, as it is now, ambitious and an, a real masterpiece, a masterpiece that was lost somewhere in the 17th century, then entered the Spanish collection, then was forgotten as Peter Bruegel was seen as possibly Euron Boss, and I will show you later why that was. Uh, and then surfaced again after 200 years and was recognized and restored as a Peter Bruegel. So here you see the details. Some very nice details which are very typical of Peter Bruegel is that they're always spectators. You're not, you're not only looking at the, Bro, at the painting yourself. Peter Bruegel always plays with looking at, back at you. In a painting by Peter Bruegel, in drawings by Peter Bruegel, you will find everywhere, you will find people looking back at you or looking at the scene. And this is, of course, Bruegel was not aware of, of psychology as we know it now, but it, it's, it's a very clear psychological trick to have people looking at you and have pe people looking at the scene. There is contact between uh, the spectator who looks at the painting and the people who are depicted in the painting. And then, uh, just because I could dwell on this painting and its relations to other works by Peter Bruegel uh, for hours, and I will not bore you with that, but just to show that Peter Bruegel used and reused motives in others here. You see the cripple who are underneath, so this is the, the, the part with St. Martin. St. Martin is here cutting the cloth. These are the beggars underneath. And in 
15, 16, 8, he made, uh, Peter Bruegel made this wonderful little panel, uh, which is in the Louvre, very small. It's, uh, uh, you really have to search for it in the Prada, uh, in, 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 in the Louvre. Um, but it's a wonderful little panel, and there you can see this group of beggars uh, again. Now, this is, a comp at first sight, and not only at first sight, a completely different painting, The Triumph of Death. It was probably painted around 1562, probably because it relates to two other paintings which I will show you in a few uh, moments. It's not dated. Um, the very interesting thing is that this is mentioned by Karel van Mander. Who is Karel van Mander? Uh, art historians will know, but to the, the public at large, he's unknown. He was an not unimportant painter who lived, was a con, more or less a contemporary of Peter Bruegel, but he became much older. But his fame is not because he was an artist, he was a good but not excellent artist, but because he was the first art historian. Karel van Mander published in 1604 a book which is called the Schilderboek, the Book of Painters, which uh, he gave a theory about art. He gave all kinds of practical tips for young painters, how they could paint. And what he did, he also gave the lives of famous Italian painters and of famous, famous painters from the Netherlands. And the last is very important. The Italians he mostly copied after an Italian example by Giorgio Vasari. But all the lives of the famous painters from the 15th century up to his own time, so that's 1600, those lives are a gold mine of a wealth of information about uh, art and artists in the, fifth, in the Low Countries in the 1560s. And he starts with Jan van Eyck and he ends with his contemporaries. So he also uh, describes the work of Peter Bruegel. He has not met Peter Bruegel, uh, Karel van Mander. Uh, fled the southern Netherlands and went to the north. Uh, he, he, he was of a Protestant, uh, he was a Protestant and did not stay in the southern Netherlands, but he knew family members, the, the sons and nephews of Peter Bruegel. So he had a lot of information and he had traveled a lot. He had been to Prague, he'd been to Vienna, he'd been to Italy, and uh, of course he'd been to many in the cities in the Netherlands. And there he describes all, many, many works and for, Karel van Mander, Peter Bruegel is the, the best painter uh, after Jeroen Bos. It's, he was known, he was described not only by Karel van Mander as the new Jeronimus Bos, the first painter who surpasses Jeroen Bos. So he was really seen as the very best of painters. And he mentions, for instance, and mentioned many paintings which still exist. And he said, and he also made another panel in which all remedies against death are used. And that is this painting. It was in the Spanish collection as early as 1774 under Palacio de Granja, and in 1827 uh, it entered the Prado. And it has been one of the highlights of the Prado ever since. Now this is a very unusual painting for Peter Bruegel, not in terms of technique, in technique, it's very typical for Peter Bruegel, the tonal colors, the thin way of painting, uh, the, the, the amazing combination of detail on the one hand and a very rapid brushwork on, on the other hand. But it's this, the, the subject, or not even the subject, because Peter Bruegel also did Last Judgments and, and he did the vices, but the fact that there is no hope at all in this painting Everything is grim. It's the ultimate triumph of death. Nothing escape, escapes. Nobody escapes. Whether you are young, here, an amorous couple, which is so engaged in each other that they are not seeing that death is already at hand. Whether you're young, you're handsome, you're old, you're ugly, you're rich, the riches are here, whether you're a cardinal or a king, whomever you are, death is the ultimate end. But the one hand is the, the, the one thing is that with most of the paintings and the, the composition of Peter Bruegel, there is always hope, the hope of life after death. It's very important to realize 
that in the 16th century, whether you were humanist, whether you were, of a pro were a Protestant, a Calvinist, or a Catholic, in the end, it was not the life on earth that was important, it's the life after death which is important. So death in itself is just a phase, a first phase on its way to life after death. But here, there is no hope at all. There is only death, and you see it in its most grim way. Now, we may be shocked through Daesh and IS, but what you see here ex exceeds everything beyond uh, expectation. People are drowned with heavy rocks. They're being decapitated. They're hung. They're thrown from the rocks. They are trampled underneath the wheels of a car. It's everywhere. It's grim, no hope at all, being eaten by dogs. All the details are there. It's grim, no hope at all. Now, on the one hand, you can understand this. If you look at the moment that it was, was painted, the crisis was becoming more imminent in the southern Netherlands. Uh, war, was more and more plundering, there were, was looting by, by armies, by troops, by mercenaries. Um, the colder temperature led to famines, led to shortage of food, uh, led to people. The cities, as I said, were growing very rapidly, but also with the result that people were dying of poverty and, and the need for food. So death was indeed everywhere. This was a reality of Bruegel. That was the reality which one would see, not of course in this grim way, but death was certainly always present. Now, here are some of the details you will see. So here you will see your money and the riches you have during life will not help you after life. Here you see a cardinal being uh, deported. Dep Ported to hell, you see that the cardinal's hat has been taken over by uh, one of these devils. Now, of course, there were traditions which Peter Bruegel uh, used. Here you see how people were struck under the wheel. Um, there were traditions. Uh, there was a tradition in Italy in the 14th and 15th centru century, uh, f especially in, in mural paintings of painting the triumph of death. Those of you who go to the north of Italy and go to town halls may regularly see a triumph of death from the 15th century as a fresco painting. Um, the dance of death. Uh, one of the most famous examples by, are the woodcuts by Hans Holbein, um, but there were also uh, depicted dances of death in the miniatures in the 15th and 16th century in the Low Countries and in Germany. Um, and of course, you had, and we'll show you some examples by Jeroen Bos, um, you had the Last Judgment, which of course was a tradition where death and the resurrection uh, was always an important subject. And these were certainly sources of inspiration, but nowhere will you find anything uh, as grim as this painting. Now, as I said, this painting connects to two other paintings, and this might be a reason to why this picture is so grim, because possibly it's a hypothesis, a hypothesis which we also are researching for our uh, exhibition in Vienna uh, in 2018-19, there is this possibility that two or three paintings were made for a single collector and that perhaps they were pendants or they were connected. Now the first painting which is traditionally connected to the triumph of death is this one and this is Mad Meg de la Griet. Uh, this is a depiction which is still, its exact meaning is still a, ri a riddle, is a mystery. There are many theories about this. this. What you see is a woman. You can see here, this is Mad Meg. And we know uh, that Bruegel used this name, Dullegriet, which we know from plays from this period, but because underneath, you cannot see it, but underneath the paint, 
uh, three years ago, we discovered the word dulle. Dull means mad in 16th century Netherlands. So Bruegel intended the, the name Dullegiet to be used for this painting. So you just see this woman. She's a combination of a soldier uh, with the armory, but she also holds a frying pan as a weapon. And behind her are scorned women, which are plundering uh, hell. So uh, you might, it, it, it's, people often say it's Shakespeare, but I recently discovered it's not by Shakespeare. You perhaps know the quote, hell have no fury like a woman in rough. Uh, it seems to be later from the 17th century. Um, so this is what you can see here. Uh, women which are, who are so fearful that even the devils are afraid, looting hell. Um, now this is interesting because here you have a kind of reversal of the hierarchy. Um, this is, and it is, this is quite typical uh, for the 16th century, that there are a number of paintings where the traditional hierarchy between men and women is being reversed. Um, and, and this is also one of them. And it seems, and there's now research being done, it's an ongoing research, it seems there were plays and uh, processions uh, in which women like Dullegiet played a role. I'm currently trying to, uh, with a group of researchers, uh, trying to find more documentation on this to get a more firm grip on what we're seeing. In tonal qualities, it's the same kind of painting. It's, it's grew, it's dark, it's brown, but here is more humor, of course. Here, it's not the ultimate triumph of death. You see death, you see devils, but what you see is actually uh, humans which are uh, defeating death, are defeating devils, are stronger uh, than hell. Of course, it's a mimicking reality, but this offers a glimpse of hope. This painting is dated 1561. It's long thought that the date was 1562, but more thorough examination showed must read 1561. But this painting is 1562. This is the third. The three paintings are just exactly the same size, so just a difference of half a centimeter. Um, these three paintings. And now this is also a fight. You can see it's in Brussels, in the Royal Museum of Fine Arts in Brussels. This is the fall of the rebel angels. And so there was a fight, there was a rebellion in, 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 uh, led by Lucifer, who was one of the archangels in heaven. Um, and Lucifer led an, 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 uh, legions of rebellion angels uh, against Michael, who was the, uh, the general of the other uh, angels. And it was a fight which, of course, leads to the defeat of the devils, which then all fall out of hell, out of the heaven, and go down into the earth. And that's the beginning of, of hell. So this is very, very interesting. Here you have a painting which is completely the opposite of the triumph of death, because here you have the fight between the good and the evil, and you have the triumph of the good. You have the triumph of faith, you have the triumph of uh, the angels who were faithful to God, who fought for God, and it's the fall, and the ultimate fall, of all the rebellious angels. So it is an interesting hypothesis that these three form a kind of suite and kind of belong together, possibly were made for the same the collector. We simply do not know. We have no documents, uh, unfortunately, about these. So Fomanda writes about one of them that he has seen it, but he doesn't mention where. He doesn't mention the other paintings, which implies that at the end of the 16th century, they were not to be seen as a group. And of the other paintings, we simply do not know where they were, who owned them, or who commissioned them. But we do hope that in the next two years, technical examinations of all three, they are now currently being studied. I had a meeting with Miguel Sugasa this afternoon. Uh, the research uh, on the triumph of death and conservation treatment will start the beginning of next year. 
the De Lachiet will also move from the museum and will also have a conservation treatment, also be uh, a research. Uh, and this will be researched in Brussels, so within a year or a year and a half, we will have a lot of documentation on the paintings, technical documentation. We will see what comes out f uh, after the restoration, except this one, this does not have to be uh, restored, does not have to be cleaned. And we do hope uh, that in 2018-19, uh, we will be uh, either be able to prove this hypothesis and say more if they belong together as a group and know more about the date, dating and whether they uh, have to be seen in, in, in balance with each other or not. And I'm also very happy to say that it seems quite plausible that the Mad Mag and the Triumph of Death will be seen together, not only in Vienna, but also here in Madrid. The contract still has to be signed, but it looks very good that you will see these paintings together. Now, if you look at this, these paintings, I think none of you, you are so familiar with the work of your owner's boss. You're so lucky to have this, uh, all the splendor of boss and to have had this magnificent exhibition uh, earlier this year. Nobody will have any trouble in connecting a work like this with Jeroen Bos. Here you see Jeroen Bos, a uh, portrait also uh, made around 1571, but it's not Bos who's depicted here. It's an, uh, certainly not a portrait of him. But now, if you look at this painting, uh, you can compare it to the works of Jeroen Bos very easily, whether you go to the Garden of Earthly Delights and, of course, specifically go to the right wing panel. Uh, it becomes very obvious. You can go to other works specifically. That was sadly not in the exhibition. It could not move. It was in Vienna and the, and the Akademie für Bildende Kunste. Uh, one of the true highlights also in his oeuvre, the, uh, the Last Judgment, um, strongly related to The Last Judgment from Bruges, which was in the exhibition. Now, all these have a very, and, and of course, the temptation of St. Anthony in Lisbon, all these have a very strong connection in the details, uh, in the build-up. Um, I could give you countless examples. You can also look at the Haywain, specifically here to the right. If you look, for instance, at this group, and you look at this group, the horse, I have the details here. So this it comes from the Haywain. Here you have the skeleton with the cart, and there are many more details which connect to the world of Hieronymus Boss. So this has a very strong connection. But why this painting? Well, in the first place, if you look at the sheer ambition of the composition, I recently noted it, and uh, we did not include this in our, 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 our publication, which Pilar and I wrote, but there are aspects of the compositions by Ewan Boss, and specifically the composition here, which in its ambition and the way the people uh, are, are, are mingled and, and the intricacy of, of, of the human gestures and the postures, which are not exactly the same, but are one of the few uh, examples which uh, Peter Breugel could use. Um, and you have to realize that compositions by Jeroen Bos, he could have seen one or two in originals, but he could certainly have seen many of the copies and the pastiches and versions which were extremely popular in the Southern Netherlands. So even if he has not seen the original, we do know that Breugel must have seen and must have known because there are many connections, but I, I showed these in my lecture in July uh, between the two. So that's one point. But the other thing is the subject matter. Now, in 1565, 15, uh, there were two remarkable things. There was a kind of revival of the appraisal for Jeroen Bos in Antwerp and Brussels. And this led, one, to a print. This print was made around 1562, 1565. Here it says, Jeroen Bos, inventor. And this was published by Jeroen Koch. And what is the subject? That is St. Martin. Now, in 
composition and, and the way the subject is, is treated is completely different. What is the same is that it's between, it's uh, somewhere between the urban culture and the countryside, but otherwise the subject is completely different. But some details, like the beggars, people here, do have a certain resemblance. But Bruegel must have known and seen this print. It's very plain and simple. Jeronimus Koch was the printer and publisher of prints by Peter Bruegel. They knew each other extremely well, so every print that Jeronimus Koch published, Bruegel must have seen and probably uh, have had a copy himself. So he must have known that there was a composition of St. Martin and St. Martin's Feast by Jeroen Bos. And he must have known this for sure because at exactly the same moment, in 1516, 1565, in Brussels, where Bruegel lived at that time, so as I said at the very beginning, he moved from Antwerp to Brussels. Um, in Brussels, uh, a tapestry with another variant version of the St. Martin by, after Jeroen Bos was woven. And tapestries were extremely prestigious, were the most expensive, most prestigious works of art until the end of the 16th century. So it is for sure that in the, in the years that this was woven, Peter Bruegel must have seen the production of, and, and, uh, of this tapestry and must have known this composition. So what I do feel is that Bruegel's extremely ambitious, it's large, it's the largest painting which we have, it's extremely ambitious in terms of its composition, all the people pouring over each other, it's so complicated, so intricate, it is my feeling, and I cannot prove it, it's a hypothesis, is that this is Bruegel's deliberate artistic competition with somebody who was a great source of influence. So this is not repeating Bosch. This is not using Bosch as a direct source of inspiration, but using him as a source of inspiration for a, very, for a specific subject, and using him as a source of inspiration for its complex structure, its complex composition. And then, before my concluding remarks, I still give you, uh, as I did in July, then the words of Karel van Mander, who ends his life, his biography of Peter Bruegel, with verses. Who then is this boss? Jeroen, once more returned to the world, who trained with the brush and deft with the stylus, very apt with the, the pen, the stylus is a pen, so imitates for us the dreams of his competent master. So Bruegel is trained with the brush and is very, very good with the pen and the brush and imitates the dreams of his competent master, Jeroen Bos, that meanwhile he surpasses him as well. Grow in boldness, Peter, as you do fruitfully in art, in the manner of your old master by painting lively poses which are most amusing, but you deserve, however, unanimously to be royally praised, no less than any other master. So those are the words of a contemporary who links the two and tells us that Bosch was surpassed as the greatest master until Bruegel was then surpassed by Peter Bruegel. And then to end, I don't think it's a mere coincidence that these two paintings, here, the Feast of St. Martin and the Triumph of Death, are now in the Prado. They have been in Spanish collections so long. So they thus acquire to a certain taste, certain taste for the 15th and 16th century. If you look, for instance, at the Habsburg collection, the Habsburg, the Viennese, the, the, the Austrian Habsburg collection, if you look at the subject, you will not find subjects, and you will find nothing as grim as the triumph of death, you will find no references to the Boschian uh, mode, the Boschian tradition, if you go into the Bruegel room in Vienna. It is my hypothesis, it's my idea that the fact that Philip II had acquired a taste for Jeroen Bos kind of formed a tradition, formed a way 
of looking at Netherlands art that somehow, one can speculate that this is part of the cultural identity of Spain, but I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a sociologist, so I leave this with speculations. But it certainly is it's a taste, the taste for Bosch, which was founded in Spain in the 16th century and became extremely popular, became extremely formative and shaped a kind of canon, a kind of tradition here in Spain in looking at Netherlandish art and that this is, in my opinion, one of the reasons why exactly these two paintings came into Spanish collections so early and now are magnificently present here in this beautiful museum where you have the luxury to compare the two masters and above all have a third master, Goya, who with Los Desastros stands in the same kind of tradition. You are extremely lucky to have this museum here and to look at these collections. I envy you and I wish you a very pleasant evening.